the big but in that, in this whole system design, is that governments need to put in the money. Yeah. And we've known for 30 years, every government of every persuasion, almost without fail, has stepped back from their social license, their social responsibility yep. to fund higher education appropriately. And what's happened is the Australian universities rightly have taken the signal and said, okay, well, we want to be world-class. We yep. want to have the best research. We want to have the best students. But in order to do that, we need to educate a bulk of other types of students. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder founder of the Koala News. I'm coming to you from Wadjuk Noongar country in Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of the Global Society coming to you from Garrigal Land in Sydney. Dirk and I were just having a bit of a chuckle before we started recording. That's probably why you can hear laughter in our voices. We might tell a little bit about that later on, but Dirk, I wanted to start off on something different. There's a very catchy headline in the Koala this week written by Tracy Harris, and that was strategic framework open for consultation, dot, 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 blink and you'll miss it. This is kind of an important moment in uh, Australian international ed, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. For those that are probably listening, are probably aware that uh, the government's got two pieces of work out for consultation at the moment. The first one is the strategic framework, and that is due at 5pm on Friday, June 14. So we're looking at a little bit over two weeks from now. It's probably open for consultation all in all, like three, three and a half weeks. So yeah, it's a pretty it. short time frame, in, in my view. The other piece that's out that's open at the moment is actually obviously the the legislative requirements or the, the legislation that that's, that's going through. So yeah, mate, folks are busy around the country at the moment putting in government submissions to to those things. It's a really interesting process, I'm going to say. You know, I've had a really good look, and obviously Tracy covered it in the story as well. But the government certainly for the framework, the government has asked or has put forward our twenty questions slash propositions and asking for responses on them. And for the sake of this conversation, I think I've pulled out one and, and sent it across to you prior to us recording to just to get it across it. It's number 13. And and I might just read it out for the viewers at, at home to be able to understand it. And then maybe we can, we can have a bit of a chat and break it down. But proposition number 13 is, a managed system to deliver sustainable growth over time will build on measures already underway to improve the quality and integrity of the sector. This will provide clarity to providers and students, help preserve the sector's social license, support Australia's skills needs, and advance the viability of regional providers. This approach will be enabled by legislative amendments, which again are those things that are currently sitting there, to manage growth in the number of enrolments in courses and at providers giving crucial certainty to education providers about the size of the sector. Now, mate, I don't know about you, but where do you start in responding to something like that? I mean, it's a pretty clear statement, but when you break it down, I, I've i got so many questions about it. As you were reading that, my initial feeling was one of being insulted, to be honest. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even on the inbound side of international education. I've been always been on the outbound side of international education, but hmm. there's, there's so many assumptions and misinformation, not quite the right word, but I don't know. It's, it feels disrespectful to me, to be honest. Yeah, well, look, I think it, it's, I mean, it's certainly, it reeks of being written by somebody who doesn't actually understand the sector for a start. And who, whomever that person is, I guess I apologize, but don't apologize, if that makes sense. I certainly don't want to want to be personal. But, you know, one would expect that the government would have a better idea as to how the sector operates. So, mm. but if, uh, for me, let's I mean, break it down, just, let's get into yeah, it. Yeah, let's break it down. So, a managed system to deliver sustainable growth over time will build on measures already underway to improve the quality and integrity of the sector. There's two points over that. So deliver sustainable gro growth over time. I, I'm not sure I understand the prerequisite for sustainable growth over time. Obviously, we're in a very we're in a retracting situation at the moment where the government has made it very clear that they don't want the sector to be as large as what it is for the reasons that I think we'll get into into later, mainly housing, housing the, the loose connection to housing, and then in, improve the quality and integrity of the sector. I mean, I think the sector's got a great reputation globally. Sure, in any review that is done that is is as widespread as it is, there will be examples of lack of quality and lack of integrity. But they're very, very minimal. Very minimal. And and so this kind of thought that, you know, the sector is going through an, an integrity issue on a system wide basis at the moment is just is just false. Um, so it, it's really sad. Then we go on to the next uh, the next sentence, and it provides clarity to 
you know, providers and students help preserve the sector's social license. Now, I don't know about you, but I've worked in the sector for 20 years and I always thought the yeah, social so license... <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I always thought the social license was that we're a major global provider of education services where mm -hmm. generally eight in 10 students will come here. They will receive a high quality education that is portable and they will take that either back home or to a third party country where they can use the skill, the requisite skills that, that they've developed here and be able to contribute to the skills demands either back in their own country or in a third area. We've worked so hard to make sure that Australian degrees are portable globally. To think that social license is, has a very different connotation to it, 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 it blows my mind. You know what I think is going on here, Dirk, to, to be honest? This is just like government speak tagline. Feels like something that's been focus focus grouped, and you know, like I really like Jason Clare as an education minister. Overall, I think he's done a very very good job. And to hear this coming sort of out of his mouth and out of the mouths of other ministers and and people representing government, it just sounds like focus group talk. Where it sounds impressive, and it sounds like, oh yeah, of course we need to protect social license, mm -hmm. but there's actually no meat behind that in terms of the way the government's presenting presenting this. To me, it really just feels like rattling a can that your average punter in a swing, swinging seat will go, oh yeah, of course we need to protect the social license and inherent in saying that the government's protecting the social license means that international educators across the board, as you said, system-wide are not protecting you know, yeah. the social license. And, yep. and we, we know that's false, as, as you said. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Not, not no, understanding the providers that, that are in part of any system, people abusing it, but across the board yeah, the easy way to respond to that is I don't think our universities have ever been ranked better globally. So when you think about quality and social license, we're right up there. And you know when you look at the amount of students, I think we've spoken about this in a previous podcast, but when you look at the percentage of students that of Australian universities that are in you know the top 200 or top 500 universities in Australia, it's much, much higher based on on you know, the, the number of institutions that we have in the higher education space than a lot of other countries. So we're punching above our weight in terms of quality, but yet we seem to be having this this kind of this this view put to us that we're not quality and the social license is being denigrated and it isn't. And, and it's really, really sad. But the next point I want to bring up is actually, there's a theme that runs through this, this document around Australia's skills needs. Again, I go back to that kind of statistic of, of roughly eight in 10 international students will leave after their, their student journey, which means two in 10. And again, statistically, we, I've seen numbers that's one in 10. Let's say two in 10 and be a little, bit, uh, a little bit generous. will actually stay on to permanent migration. We've had for a very, very long time a nexus between education and skilled migration. For the most part, fairly successful. What I've banged on about for a very long time is that those people who graduate in those skills areas need to stick in those skills areas and mm -hmm. forge careers in those skills areas and build better lives and do that. This isn't an education provider problem. This isn't a student problem per se. This is how do we get these graduates to continue into. We don't just give them PR because, hey, you've graduated from an accounting degree and you get so many points for that. And then we find out later that they've gone into an entrepreneurial activity or they've done something different from accounting. How do we get these people into those skilled professions to actually, over time, minimise the, the ongoing need for those for those skill shortages. And you know, I, I bang on it about it all the time. I looked up some stats earlier, but you know, the CPA is saying that the accounting is still they're going to still need more accountants over time. Accounting's been on the skills register for as long as I've been in international education, which is probably about twenty years or so. If we haven't produced, as in graduated, enough accountants by now. I'm not sure what's going on. And every university has a Master of Professional Accounting. I shouldn't say every because I'm sure that there's not, but the majority of the universities have you know, Master of Professional Accounting. The problem is not producing graduates in accounting. The problem is actually having them become members of the CPA or the, or the CA and actually having them work as accountants. So again, there's this narrative that's being built around international education. The only students, or I shouldn't say the only, but, but there's, this, there's this view that students who come here should be feeding into our skills shortage agenda. Again, I go back to what happened to our place in our region, what happened to our place in the globe where students can come here, upskill, and then return home or move to another part of the globe with those skills 
delivering to those communities, but also knowing that the wings that got them there were from Australia. And that soft yeah. power that we speak about for so long that was evident in some of the reports around, you know, that's been built on since the 50s in the Colombo plan, if we're being, you know, if we're being brutally honest, when we've got, you know, Australian graduates, ministers and governments overseas, are, are we eroding that element of what we do right now? I think we are. It's incredible. I think, mate, just, you know, the first part of that proposition that you were just reading out, a managed system to deliver mm. sustainable growth. And here we're talking about a government managing a system and hopefully doing it well. And you know what you've just pointed out with the with the accounting issue, for example, just highlights. I mean, where do we have great confidence that governments are fantastic at managing complex systems like this? Not an awesome track record across the board of that being done well at scale by by governments of any persuasion. Absolutely. Then the next bit, I guess, if we move on to it, is is the viability of regional providers. You know, we've done lots of lots of things in the past to to try and uh, advise regional education. And you know, as someone who spent a lot of time in the regions growing up, and you know, through I guess my engagement outside of or in country New South Wales, regional towns are fantastic. But what I would say is if, if you're a, an Asian student that comes from Asia, you're generally going to be used to a, an urban environment, which is, you know, from a culture perspective, very, very different from a regional town anywhere in Australia. So coming into a regional town is, is as much a culture shock as, you know, a, a kid from Broken Hill, you know, landing in Tokyo and, and walking down, I'm going to mess this up, but Shibu or, or any of those areas. It's it's just incredible. So I think we also need to keep in mind, you know, where we draw students from, what that experience is going to be and how we provide the mechanism for that transition. Regional education providers are fantastic, but, you know, they're not going to be for everyone either. So it's, it's a really, really important, important area. And again, then finally, this giving crucial certainty to education providers about the size of the sector. Do education providers need certainty about the size of the sector? And I guess if you're coming from an interventionist approach and you're saying at a system level, it needs to look and smell and taste and push like this, then maybe actors within it do need some, edu- uh, some education or do need certainty around what their role is in the overall size or composition of that. But it's a very interventionist approach, a very interventionist approach. So again, that, that just the whole proposition around education providers needing certainty about the size of the sector, it's incredible. It really is. It's um, breathtaking. I put a post up on LinkedIn earlier this, this week, which said, said simply, the government wouldn't cap iron ore exports. So why would they cap international education? That seemed mm. to really touch a nerve. You know, I think last time I checked, it's been up for a couple of days, been, you know, viewed 10,000 times and commented on about 100 times, something like that. It was a good post, mate. It was a good post. I just think since simplicity sometimes cuts through here, capping the size of a sector, I don't think that anybody would say that we shouldn't design the best possible system. Maybe in that, in an ideal world, you would say, okay, Australian institutions are 80% local students, 20% international, and we're going to increase the entry requirements and we're really going to get the best and brightest international students, and, 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 and. The big but in that, in this whole system design, is that governments need to put in the money. Yeah. And we've known for 30 years, yeah. every government of every persuasion, almost without fail, has stepped back from their social license, their social responsibility yep. to fund higher education appropriately. And what's happened yeah. is the Australian universities rightly have taken the signal and said, okay, well, we want to be world-class. We yep. want to have the best research. We want to have the best students. But in order to do that, we need to educate a bulk of other types of students. And they've yep. done that very, very well. So there's this kind of hypocrisy of government on one side saying we need to have a sector that's structured and sustainably growing and all that whilst on the other hand holding the purse strings yeah. and saying oh yeah but by the way we're not going to actually tip in the money for you to be world class and maybe speaking about money we can go on to the interesting performance by the treasurer and his appearance on insiders over the weekend yes yes so not this sunday just gone but the sunday before the treasurer appeared on insiders as you rightly say and it was a really interesting conversation for anyone that, that that watched it. And for those who haven't, you can eye view it, I'm sure. But yeah, he basically was on the show and, and David Spears interviewed him. It was just after Peter Dutton's res- budget response. And David Spears, the host, kind of pinned him down on migration. He asked him a few different ways whether migrants were really at the heart of the housing crisis. And 
After the third question, he the, the treasurer actually came back with the response at the margins at best. And it was a really interesting tell, I thought. If we've been talking about the migration system or the you know, net overseas migration being a significant tr- contributor to the housing crisis and cost of living and all of those things that we, I guess, have known the government has been peddling over the last little bit. Mm. And then for the treasurer to come out and say, well, actually, it's at the margins at best and that building new houses is actually the centerpiece of how to get out of this crisis. I mean, for me, it was just, it was like, you know, the clouds opened and the, and, the, and the sunshine came through. It must be awkward in the cabinet room if the treasurer has that belief and the ministers that are having to push out this objective or this this new policy direction are doing so outside of, of this view. So the question then becomes is, if the treasurer is of that belief, and we know through the property report, we know through the Group of Eight research, that really migration isn't contributing to our housing crisis, What's the policy objective of reducing international students? And the only other thing that I can come up with, which we've wrote about, written about in the Koala, is around this dodgy college narrative. So if we discount the housing thing now and we say, well, you know what, they contribute, but it's marginal to the housing issue, then this whole quality integrity issue that we've been talking about is also a little bit flawed. If we think about, it was only a couple of weeks ago where the government sent out 34 warning letters, not yeah. Cease of trade issue. We're not kicking them out. They're not doing it. They're warning letters. 34 of them. There's 1,483 Krikos providers, and they sent out 34 warning letters. So again, you start looking at what the narrative is. Oh, there's dodgy colleges, ghost colleges. No, people aren't doing the right thing. Oh, well, this is a, you know, the migration review, the, this review, you know, signaled integrity issues. Mate, 34 of 1,483. Again, when we talk about those issues, it's not rampant exploitation. It's not system wide. We 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 can actually focus in on these things quite quite easily. And so it's really concerning as a you know I guess as a commentator as as we do on this podcast and as somebody who writes about this stuff regularly. It's really disconcerting to see that both those policy objective outcomes are, are now really being called into question as just complete fluff. So then the question becomes: Is why why are we doing all this? Just to dive into that a little bit more, 34 providers, that's 2.29% yep. of the registered Krikos providers, which yep. means 97%, 97.1%, apparently there's no issue right now. Yep. I was going right to, just as you were talking there, Dirk, I was just thinking about the construction sector, for example. Yeah. <laughs> like what what percentage, not to tar all of the construction sector with the same brush, because obviously very good builders out there. But also an industry replete with, you know, organizations going bust and cutting corners here, there and everywhere. Would it be less than 2.2%? I don't know. Yeah, so, I don't know about that one either. As, as you say, like back to this idea of a structured managed system, is it just like classic case of just building in more red tape and over bureaucratizing something, which is actually, for the most part, working pretty well? Yeah, and mate, this is where I guess I I come up short. I'm I'm not I'm not across why. Again, the the policy objective is I think around winning the next election. They've found an issue that polls well. They're wanting to run it, and now now it's coming undone. And you know, we're all as we've spoken about before. Let's hope the electorate understands that. Let's hope that there is some political force within Parliament that actually stands up and says actually, you're wrong. This is not right. We're not going to see it from the Liberals, clearly, but let's hope and pray that an independent or the Greens or someone stands up and looks at the actual objective data and says, you're wrong. Because what I fear is that on top of these two issues, the government's now creating an environment that will see colleges fail over time. And I use an example where I had a college reach out to me probably a week and a half, two weeks ago. They had a Spanish student whose visa uh, was refused. Now, Spain is a level one country, assessment level one, which means they're the lowest risk. These guys are an English college and the Spanish, and they were also assessment level one, the lowest risk. They, The Spanish student clearly, in, and I've seen their a visa application clearly stated that they wanted to come and study English for a fixed amount of time and they were going to go home. They had a job to go back to in Spain and they wanted to come out and essentially do some English, probably have a good time while, while they're here, maybe do a bit of part-time work, but pick up on their English and, and head back home. The visa was refused and it's gobsmacking. Like these are the kind of visas 
the, the visa refusals that we're starting to see now. Now, in itself, it's one visa refusal, right? You go, mm, well, when that happens en masse, which is happening at the moment, there's a downstream effect. And so if we think about this, the, the system that has been constructed at the moment, an assessment level one provider, if they get a certain manner of visa rejections, which quite frank are, you know, not right, they've got every chance that they won't be assessment level one into the future. They'll be assessment level two. Now, let's take that over a 12-month or an 18-month period. That that assessment level one provider, which is now two, if that keeps going, they'll end up being assessment level three. Now, once you get to assessment level three, and we saw some data come from uh, the IEAA admissions and compliance, where they're talking about assessment level one visas being turned around in a certain amount of time, assessment level two, my understanding was assessment level three was around 80 days to get a visa. So when you start picking that, and if they go further, there's every right that the government will start looking at these assessment level threes that may have been there for a period of time, and they're not going to get off the bottom. Once you get into assessment level three, it's going to be difficult to get off because your ability to recruit students and get them through the visa system just becomes so much harder. Talking about a managed system, the government brought in the SSVF. It's a streamlined student visa framework. Yep. In order to make this whole process simple and transparent, yep. and yet inside that inverted you know, quote marks managed system, yep. there's a complete lack of transparency, and the system's Correct. not working. So Correct. where is the confidence for the Australian taxpayer that a managed system is actually going to do what they say it's going to do? Well, you're absolutely right. This is my concern. So I'm playing devil's advocate, and I'm thinking worst case scenario, right? But what if uh, 34 warning letters that were issued in the last tranche? What happens at the next tranche when you've got these providers that may have been assessment level two, so they're, they're, they're decent, but they've dropped to assessment level three. What if the government turns around and say, right, all assessment level three are now going to get a warning letter because your recruitment practices aren't doing well? And it's based on the, on the back of a whole series of inconsistent visa refusals, as opposed to genuine attempts or genuine fraud. And that's my real concern that the government, if over time, they're creating a system which will ping providers on the back of visa refusals, which are just BS, mate. BS. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's. It, I think it's a space that we need to watch, and as a sector, and certainly those people who may have a closer sort of voice to the government than than what I do or what you do really need to be aware of because there's every potential for that to occur. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe we move on to like the Crycost registration data. You've been doing some some interesting digging on those. A couple of articles published in the Quala over the last few weeks about Crycost data. But what have you what have you uncovered this this week? Obviously, I mean the context is is the government's obviously talking about retracting the, the sector. They're they're obviously spruiking lower amounts of visas being visas being approved, etc. 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 They're talking about caps. Interestingly enough, in the background, so um, just to explain for to anyone who may not know, we have a system called PRICOS. It's a registration system. So anyone who wants to educate international students or provide education services to international students needs to be on this register. They need to apply and there's a process. As part of that process, the government will allocate them an upper limit of the amount of students that they can take. And it's generally, I guess, preempted on you know the location space they have, how many classes they can run, all of those sorts of things feed into a metric that says, Rhino X College or X University, you can be registered for 20,000 students or you can be registered for 500 or 200 or, or whatever. In a sense, we have a system that exists already that have upper limits, which could be construed as a cap. In that cap or in those upper limits, there were 1,520,584 allocated places across all CRICOS institutions as of I think it's the 2nd of May this year when the data was published. Compare that to the April number of, of 1,514,413, and the register actually between April and May has grown by 6,171 places. So we're actually in the bad while we're talking about retracting, while we're talking about lower visa numbers, the capacity for education providers registered with the Australian government through the Department of Education on this CRICOS register is actually growing. And it's a little bit oxymoronic at the moment in that sense. I ran back to January to look at what's gone on this year. So since January, the student places have grown 41,242. So the, again, the upper limit capacities of these providers grown by 41,000. It's just 
I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's astonishing because nothing should surprise you these days, but it's just a tad weird. You know what I think this comes back to, Dirk? Honestly, and as you're running these numbers and you know, you're talking about them, the thought that comes to me is that so much of these decisions come down to like an individual person, to a human being, right? Mm-hmm. So the person that's proving those Krikos registered places, for example, is a human sitting in an office, probably somewhere in Canberra, running through spreadsheets and numbers and this, that, and the other. And they're just yep. ticking boxes and going, yep, okay, increase there, increase there. So this one human being isn't necessarily looking at the entire policy of the Australian government. And likewise, the person that rejected that Spanish student's visa is essentially obeying a directive from their boss and their boss's boss that's yep. saying, tough on everything, cut everything down. And they're actually pausing to reflect that, hey, by rejecting this Spanish student's visa, I'm actually putting a black mark against a good education provider and that's going to have downstream of uh, effects yep. so i can't feel like you've got this just all of these decisions being made in vacuums yep. which you know on their own are just one-offs yep. but when taken across the board not only look like a complete schmozzle but as you've rightly pointed out have real downstream effects yep. and that just feels like the crazy car careening down the street out of control which is not a happy place to be as a sector. And the thing is that government, government should be worried about that too. Governments love to be in control. Yep. But clearly there's too many moving parts in this. It's too complex. And yep. government just doesn't have the capability to manage that in a managed system. Yep. It's, it's a fair point. Two, no, mate, let's go through two, two more stats and then we'll move on to some good news. So in terms of registered providers, so between April and May, there were four extra providers added to the system. So 1479 in April to 1483 in May. And then registered courses, there were 97 additional courses that were added, added to the register between April and May. And that went from 25,937 to 26,034. So again, it's like you say, one part of the system is doing one thing while the other part of the system is doing something completely different. You know what that looks like to me, Dirk, with those numbers? It looks like steady, sustainable growth. Sustainable growth. <laughs> Just prob- probably not, not at the base level the government's looking for. Anyway. Mate, let- good news. Give me some good news. Give me some good news. All right. Yesterday, the government, and when I say yesterday, we are recording on a Tuesday, so it would have been Monday the 27th. The government announced that the temporary graduate visa for research students, and it's master's research and doctoral degree, will remain at 50 years of age. So the recommendation, which came out of one of the reviews, was that that would move down to 35. There was a lot of people that pushed back on this one. I mean, anyone in the research community stood up and said, that's crazy. So it's some sense, I think, that the government has re- has, has rethought this one through and have probably come up with a, with a pretty good outcome on this one, I think. So congratulations to that person, that person's boss, and that person and that boss's boss for for actually having some common sense on this one. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And then just to finish off, the IEAA held their admissions and compliance forum last week, and from all reports, it was it was a fantastic day. One of the interesting ones, and I think you will have an opinion on this because we've spoken about AI for uh, quite some time. But Stefan Tapescu, who's the founder of Union Emissions Minds, gave a presentation, and one of the major stats that came out of that one was that it's anticipated that. of admissions will be automated in the not too distant future. Mate, here's your hobby horse, AI creeping in again. I find that astonishing, you know, in terms of 80% of it being computer generated or or computer learned. Obviously, obviously there's there's, there's humans behind that, but yeah. I think that that stat is understated. I mean, there's no time frame on that, but I I really believe it's going to be 99% and probably within a shorter time frame than we actually realised. There's just so much repetitive matching work that needs to be done there it's exact it's just rife for ai to, yeah, to yeah. handle that kind of stuff as you said most important part of that is that there's the human oversight but even at the moment the models that are out at the moment and at time of recording open ai recently released chat gpt 40 so the yeah. enhanced model of chat gpt which seems like more of a speed boost and a bit of an improvement in logic but it's not the massive quantum leap that we're expecting coming soon but it's not that far we know it's yeah. coming, and mm-hmm. and I think so many of those just process oriented jobs, of which you know admissions, compliance, this sort of things is has a fairly large component. Ninety nine percent of it is is going to get passed to the bots. Yeah, it's got to be really interesting. So I always think about admissions in terms of there's two bits, right? The, the one is do you fit this criteria? Do you 
you know, yes, no, tick. And I think you're absolutely right. The AI bit that freaks me out, if I can be really honest, is that subjective notion in the admissions process where you've got to put in an essay, where you've got to put in a statement of purpose around why you want to become a doctor or a veterinarian. And, you know, the program coordinator traditionally looks over that and says, yes, that's a good answer to that. Mapping that in AI just scares the pants off me, mate. It probably doesn't you, but it does me. I don't know. It's interesting. Like, I I get quite excited about that because a lot of what you're talking about, you know, that sort of feel, you know, the subjective Mm. feel from a course coordinator about a particular candidate, it's about pattern recognition and it's about word recognition, just different cues. And in fact, a friend of mine who works in in digital space, digital product development space, was talking about how, you know, a lot of what they do in their research is is taking transcripts from interviews with, with users and, and doing word pattern recognition. And AI is brilliant at that, at like yeah. pulling out trends and colors and flavors. So, so I don't think that element necessarily goes away. I just think it gets completely transformed. So that yeah. course coordinator, instead of having to read through a two-page entry essay or whatever it might be, actually gets some sort of report that's color-coded and categorized and what have you. And it's a much easier process of them glancing through that and being like, yep, this conforms with what I'm looking for. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Like I said, still still scares me. Here's the pants. <laughs> I'm loving it. And I'm looking forward to soon. I've got this announcement about what I'm working on right now in the AI space and why I'm so crazy passionate about it, but still a few more weeks away yet. Well, Dirk, all this talk about AI just makes me think that, you know, AI is only one side of the coin and so much of this amazing industry of ours is, is about the human element, isn't it? It sure is, Rob. I think we've covered that off a few times over our previous podcasts. There's nothing like a, a good get together and the people that work in the industry do it do it pretty well. Well, mate, on that point, I, I've got some exciting news and this is the what first is time this has been announced anywhere. Global Horizons, the podcast, is now the official podcast of Australia's International Education Conference, the AIEC and I think you're the first person to hear it, mate. Oh, congratulations. That is, it's amazing news. You know what? I don't want to be self-servient, but the Koala News is also a media partner of the AIC too. So, mate, I think we're, we're, we're both pretty stoked. I think we are both pretty stoked because, as we both know, it is the premier event for Australian international educators in Melbourne this year. And maybe now is a good time for us to bring in our special guest for the episode. What do you reckon? For sure. Absolutely. Bring her in. Our guest today is Sally Gaden DB, who is the Marketing and Communications Manager at IDP. Great to have you on the Global Horizons podcast. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, Sally. Thanks for having me on, guys. Hi. And we're so excited about this year's conference. And of course, today is a very big day in regards to the whole AIEC journey throughout the year, isn't it? It is. So today, AIEC registration has opened, finally. We're really excited that it's going to be a really great conference. There's a lot on as per normal. I think most people who come to AIEC are just blown away by just how much is on. So today we've announced our registration is open. We have super early bird specials for those of you who like to get in quick. If you know that you're going to be attending AIEC regardless, you can jump in and get $300 off the registration price, which is fantastic. And if you're an IDP client or an IEAA member, you get even more. But there's a whole bunch of fees and inclusions, different types of pricing for people. But what's really good about AIC is there's just so much on. We have a program releasing in July. We've got the Expo, which we've packed even more in this year, which actually we've had to go outside the Expo Hall because it's got too big. No, wow. So, yeah. It's like something in Melbourne, isn't it? Wow. It really is. It's going to be a really, really fun event. So we're hoping to welcome everybody from the international education sector from both Australia and overseas. Last year, we had about 17,000. We think we're going to get more this year. So we're hoping to see you all there. You know what I love? I love when this conference opens. You know, when, when you check in for a flight and you get like your passenger reference number, like, and I always love having a load. I don't know what it is. I love having a low number, like 005. I'm the fifth person to have checked in for the plane. And I always see the same. I'm like, as soon as that email comes, I'm just like, I want to be that 0003 in terms of reference numbers. I don't know if that's healthy obsession or not. I think that sort of speaks to the marketer's obsession with the analytics. I don't know about you, but when I push go on, a, on an email announcing registration, I'm always looking at the Google Analytics to see where people are coming from all over the world. And it is from all over the world. 
it's very nice to see those numbers come in. We are obviously very excited to have you guys along this year. Obviously, we're welcoming Koala as a media partner and we're so excited to have an Australian publication involved for an Australian conference. So you're joining a, a great lineup of existing media partners there, Dirk. And Rob, obviously, the podcast. Is it even a conference if we don't have a podcast? This is the question. Everybody seems to have a podcast these days, but the international education one for Australia is spot on. So it's just what we've needed. I'm looking forward to going past the booth and seeing you interviewing people. It's going to be amazing. You're going to have to be there at some point with me too. But yeah, yeah we, absolutely. We, we're, Happy to. We're going to, be, we're going to be there in the in the conference hall doing some podcasting on location, which I'm really looking forward to. Like the number of people, as as you guys know well, the number of amazing, awesome people from all across the industry who are at the conference, it, it feels to me just like the dessert smorgasbord. But I just can't, <laughs> can't get enough. And I'll be like, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so over here. Come on, on the chair. Somebody must described it to me as summer camp for international education and Whilst I take that ethos in the spirit in which it was given, yeah, we do talk about some very serious things as well. But yeah, it is a wonderful opportunity to have those meetings with people that you know you want to see. And also the serendipitous meetings that you just sort of bump into somebody at the buffet. You know, you're queuing for a coffee or waiting to go in to see a plenary keynote. It's those meetings that I think can often be the most fruitful and they sort of spark those sort of ideas that you perhaps didn't know other people were having as well. So it's great. On that note, we've also got Brain Date coming back again this year. So that's the sort of, it's like speed dating, but for people with similar interests as opposed to dating, it can be really hard to find people at events who have got a similar sort of mindset or ideas for you. So it's actually a really awesome way to get everybody in together and have chats. I did my first Brain Date at last year's AIEC. Just never kind of engaged with that format before. And honestly, my best takeaways from the conference were, were in that format. If, and if, for those listening at home, if you go back and listen to the Dual Degree Dynamite episode, I recorded that last year on location at AIEC with Simon Davies Burrows and Neil Weston from Uni of Portsmouth. And that was just an amazing discovery about this incredible dual degree setup that they've got that we, we ended up turning into a podcast because the conversation was just that good. So highly, highly recommends that people get on, get on board with that format. Yeah. Braindate's fantastic. We open up the Braindate platform before the conference starts so you can actually go in, post a topic that you want to have a chat about or browse to see who else is attending or has posted something that, that sparks that sort of interest. So it's a really, really innovative way of networking rather than just sort of going to a to the drinks, which are fantastic. You don't know what people are interested in and, and you can't talk to every single person in the room. So it really hones it down to to be really, really targeted. And they're actually really fun. We've had some really great stories come out of Brain Date. So highly recommend everybody gets involved with that. Just trying to think of social events. Obviously, the social events will, will return, but we all know that they're fun. But it's the networking as well that that really brings it all to life. So okay. Now, I know you, there's no way that you would reveal this, but have there already been internal discussions? I just want to know what it's like inside the room at IDP, internal discussions about what the conference dinner theme is is going to be, or she's nodding. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I yet to announce it, but it is, of all the things that people ask us about, it's it's not necessarily where are we next year or what's the theme, It's as in theme of the conference, it's what's the theme of the dinner. And we know how popular it is, and I can say that this year is going to be a bit of a crowd pleaser, mainly because I think everybody will really enjoy this one for, for dressing up. So for those of you who do dress up, great opportunities for those of you who don't it's fine you can come in in your jeans if you like it doesn't matter it will work for everybody but usual entertainment and fun will abound rob that was going to be my question you're a you're a pretty keen dress up person at the dinners i'm looking forward to the theme and seeing what you rock up in actually <laughs> i didn't sort of reveal this in a linkedin post last year every time i see now i see the the conference dinner theme I've committed myself to going with the first thing that comes into my mind. So, yeah, last year it was it was the theme was like multicolor or something like that, technic technicolor, and the first thing that came into my mind was body paint. And my second reaction was like, "Oh God, I'm not going to do that, am I?" And <laughs> no, I stuck to it. And then was of course completely outshone by Alex Maninsky, who is literally Mr. Conference Dinner. <laughs> 
Alec Fedlinski is my boss and is a fantastic dresser-upper of events. So I will be intrigued to see what he does this year and to see what you do, Rob, actually. But we will be announcing that in the coming weeks. We know how very, very important that is, almost as much as you know, who are the keynotes. I can't announce them yet, but we will be announcing those in the, in the coming weeks. But we do have Stan Grant returning as our MC. He's been a huge hit, so we've had him now. I think this will be the third year in a row that we'll have him. He's a fantastic host, fantastic thought leader, and he just sets the tone so beautifully. Um, he'll be a great um, one to have back. Yeah, amazing human. One last question for you, Sally. I'm always fascinated with the sort of back-end processes of how these things work. Now, of course, the call for proposals has already closed, closed, I think, back at the end of March. I imagine you would have been swamped with some really interesting topics this year. It's probably too early to actually talk about exactly what those sessions are going to be, but just broadly in general, are you happy with uh, the sort of range and quality of what's what's come back? Yeah, I think we had around 235 submissions across the four key interest areas, the 14 key interest areas, which was really great to see. We usually get around that number, but the quality this year, every year, we get some incredible submissions and the program committee is the one that has to sit there and sift through them all. The benefit of that is that we do get a really jam-packed program with some really interesting things and that's going to be announced in July. So we'll have a preliminary program coming out in July and then we'll release the full one online with online bios and abstracts, etc. a little bit after that. But in terms of hot topics, yeah, look, AI, 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 but the main thing that we've really tried to focus on with the theme this year is that obviously we work in an industry that is very much technology dependent. We are all using data analytics. We're using online methods of delivery to reach students and because that's where they live. But what we have to remember is that with all this AI, we've still got humans at the very center of all of this. And it's really important that that we retain that focus. It's so easy to get swept up in the fun and excitement and the novelty of technology. Human beings can't help but do that. But at the very heart of it, there's a student at the end and there's a student who we want to help through and enable and delight and make them feel like they are the important one and that they're not a number. So I think that the conversations we're going to have at AIEC this year are going to be pretty interesting, particularly around that. And really, when you think about what's been happening in the, the media landscape with international education of late, there's never been a better time to have AIEC. Every year we have great conversation, but this year I think we're going to have some really pertinent discussions. You know what? I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned that because one of the themes that Rob and I have kind of spoken about probably over the last three to four months has been with all the regulation changes and all the discussion, it's that, it's that student element and the student being at the center of everything. And when we see these visa refusals coming through and we see these policy changes, it just seems to be moving away from you know, focusing on that student journey. And so I'm so happy that you, that you mentioned that because you're right, it's the human element and it's it's about the student. And one of the things that I've always said is if you put the student first, everything else will fall in place. But when you start looking at all the other things and you forget about the student, that's when you start getting into trouble. And I'm really a bit concerned, I guess, that over the next six months, that that's where we're going to end up because we're not putting the student at the center. So AIC is a, a great event to be able to refocus that and make sure that the student is at the center. So, so hats off to you guys. Thank you. I think they like that. The refocusing, it is absolutely vital. We work in a really nice industry. We're not selling boring things like insurance or superannuation, but we're working with human beings here. We're making people's dreams come true. And I think that we need to remember that and embrace it and refocusing the conversation around students, humans is vital. I'm into that. Amen. Well, this is Australia International Education Conference is being held in Melbourne from the 22nd to the 25th of October. As you've heard, the theme is the human element. Hard to imagine that there is a more appropriate theme given what's going on in our industry and in the world right now. Sally, amazing to have you on Global Horizons and perhaps over the next few months, if you'd be willing to come back and maybe share some of the updates with the conference with us, that'd, that'd be incredible. Love to have you back. Yeah, I'd love to come back. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. I'm really excited to have you boy both involved with AIEC this year. I think Dirk and I are both super pumped. And as always, I was listening at home, thekoalanews.com is your website for all of the latest Australian international education news. Not just Australian, but international education news in general. So make sure you jump on and subscribe to 
the koala news dirk amazing having you on the podcast as always thanks for your time man and i will catch you again shortly look forward to it thanks rob thanks sally thank See you, you. Next time. thanks sally bye The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.